Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, asking me to uh, give a talk. And um, I sort of thought I would talk not just about sort of those implantable devices that uh, have sort of been coming up a lot and, and really are very useful, but more both devices that we, we would do through surgery, but also some of the devices that uh, you can use at home, things like the watches, cameras to monitor. And so I'm going to clump them all into things that we can use to monitor seizures, some of which we can use to treat, and some of them we don't use necessarily to treat. Uh, but the first question really is why do we want to monitor? Why do we want to monitor something besides just you know knowing when somebody has a seizure? And I think anybody who's got a family member uh, who has especially convulsive seizures wants to know when these are happening, even if you're not in the room or especially when you're not in the room, hopefully to prevent injury. And there have been at least a couple of studies to show that if you can uh, detect the seizure, uh, you can reduce the number of injuries. But it's also useful for a couple of other things. First, we often want to know how often are you seizing, and sometimes you don't know. If you're alone uh, sleeping in bed, you don't always know that you've had a seizure. Sometimes you wake up having bitten your tongue or feeling really sore, but you don't know if it was a seizure or not. So these detectors can often help uh, tell you whether that was a seizure or not. In many cases, uh, monitoring allows us then to trigger therapy detect, you know, directed just at the seizure time. It's useful uh, to uh, determine what your seizures are like. So I love it when a patient comes and says, hey, you know, I was at work and a security camera was on and it caught my seizure from beginning to end because we can really then characterize and try to figure out, okay, where's the seizure coming from? What's it likely to do next? Uh, and then the final thing that um, for me is potentially the biggest win is uh, to, the, the hope is that by monitoring, we can somehow intervene uh, in near SUDEP events and take a SUDEP event and turn it into a near SUDEP event. And so what is SUDEP? Many of you have probably heard the term, but you know, I think the surprising thing is that a lot of patients with convulsive epilepsy have not heard it. And I think that's a disservice because it is something that we can intervene on. So SUDEP stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. And I've put a picture up here of a young man by the name of Cameron Boyce. You've probably heard of him. He was a Disney star. And in his early 20s, he had kind of just moved out on his own. Um, he died in his sleep. And he had been uh, being treated for epilepsy, but uh, the family didn't really even know that SUDEP was a possibility. But I, I put his picture up because two things. First, it, you know, his death really raised the idea in the public awareness of, of SUDEP. But also, he's kind of really characteristic of who is at greatest risk for SUDEP. First, young people are. They're young, typically younger than 40, are at highest risk. Males more than females, although women do die of uh, SUDEP for some reason, uh, men die uh, more frequently. Uh, and kind of that goes with the idea of, of living alone. Young people tend to have just started taking over their own medical care, so maybe they're not as you know attentive as a parent would be to their you know medications, but also they no longer have someone in the house with them. They don't have a bed partner yet. They don't have a family member in the house who can hear them seize. And so their convulsive seizures go unnoticed. The other people that, uh, other thing that makes uh, people high risk for suit up is if they have uncontrolled seizures or intermittently controlled on multiple anti seizure medications, especially if the seizures happen at night. Uh, it turns out the majority of suit up uh, cases happen in sleep. And in the majority of those cases, people are found prone, meaning they're found lying face down uh, in their bedding. And you know, one possibility is that after big convulsive seizures, people are temporarily paralyzed. And if they're face down in a pillow, they can't roll over to sort of breathe when they need to. What this really tells us is that um, suit up is something that's potentially preventable. If you can detect a convulsive seizure, 
and you can get in there and roll somebody onto their side, maybe that's enough. And there's anecdotal evidence that that's the case. So there are these, there's this story of um, group home in England for children who had epilepsy and they would sleep you know, in cots uh, in one big room with one person monitoring them all, all night. There was never a reported SUDEP case in that environment where the child was monitored. Sometimes they would go home and they would have their own bedroom for the weekends. And sadly, the SUDEP would happen in that situation where they were suddenly unmonitored asleep in their own room where they're sort of in a, in a better environment, you would think. But because it was unmonitored and people couldn't intervene, uh, that's when the risk was actually highest. So it turns out that in most cases, all you really need to do is make sure that somebody's turned to their side, stimulate them a little bit, and that really reduces the risk, takes it from a SUDEP situation to a near SUDEP situation. So the hope is that um, if somebody's not alone or you can detect it, you can uh, improve their chances. But I do want to point out that there has been no proof that any of these remote monitoring devices reduces SUDEP risk. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First, many of these monitoring devices are relatively new on the market. And uh, SUDEP, fortunately, is extremely rare. So we don't know if, you know, in a tiny fraction of those cases where this monitoring might help. Uh, switching to what what kind of devices are out there that we might uh, look at? I, the the, the at-home devices, are, I sort of break up into three groups. Watches, things that you're going to wear on your wrist. Uh, mattress devices that can detect convulsive seizures uh, in bed. And then camera devices that can be used to monitor and with new artificial intelligence detect the seizure and send out an alert. Then there are three kinds of implantable stimulators that monitor for seizures and have a responsive stimulation. So of the sort of take home and wearable devices, there's only one that has FDA clearance. And this is a device called the Embrace 2 uh, seizure detection watch. Now, it looks like a watch, it's got a wristband and a face, but it doesn't do anything that we expect from a watch now. You can't read texts on it. You can't, you know, do video calls on it. Oh, and it doesn't tell the time. But it's still basically a watch uh, in how you use it. And uh, it's gone through a relatively rigorous process of getting certified by the FDA for seizure detection. It's got three kinds of detectors. One is, uh, the, the easiest one is it detects movements. So it's got an accelerometer in there, and uh, it, based on that, it can detect when a seizure is happening. It can monitor for temperature changes, and often there's an increase in temperature uh, right at the beginning of a seizure. And then finally, it measures the conductivity uh, or how uh, you know electricity can flow across skin, um, skin conductance. And in fact, when it, it was first developed, uh, movement was not part of the seizure detection because it wasn't developed as a seizure detector. It was, it was developed uh, to try to um, understand when children who could not communicate well were in stressful situations. So in children with severe autism, the idea was that uh, their uh, sympathetic nervous system, their fight or flight system would uh, pump, uh, jump up when they were stressed that would change the conductance of their skin and you'd be able to detect it that way. Almost by serendipity, they were trying it on a child who had both autism and seizures and it detected every time he had a seizure. And so they then expanded it, put this movement uh, detector on there and it became a very effective detector of convulsive seizures. It uh, has all these detectors built in and it's got a Bluetooth uh, connection to a phone. So as long as your, as your phone is nearby, it'll detect and it'll send a signal to your phone. And then the phone can then uh, send a text message out to whoever you tell is the person that you want to know when you're having a convulsive seizure. Um, it comes in a variety of colors. Uh, 
Uh, it costs about $250 to buy the watch itself, but you also have to pay a subscription fee for the text messaging part of things. Uh, so it's about $10 a month uh, if you want to have only one person on your text list, 20 for three, and then $45 for an unlimited number of people. And insurance coverage is inconsistent. So whenever I prescribe this to my patients, I say, you basically have to plan to pay for it yourself, um, although some people have actually gotten insurance coverage, I'm told. So the good parts of it, uh, it's useful in what I consider to be the most dangerous time. That is, when somebody is sleeping and they have a convulsive seizure, that's really the highest risk time that you want to know about. Uh, it contacts caregivers uh, uh, when it detects a seizure and it sends GPS information so that if you're not with them, you can get somebody to them, but you can find where they are. The bad, and, and the bads are getting less bad with time as they improve the device, is that there are false positives. And in all of these devices, whether they're implanted, they're AI, whatever, um, there are false positives, uh, meaning that it'll detect movement. I, I have patients say, yeah, I'm doing dishes, and I'll get a call because my, you know, sister was called, you know, texted that I'm having a seizure when I was just doing the dishes. Um, and so those false positives can sometimes make people stop using them or start to ignore it. But the false positives are getting less and less as the algorithm gets better and better at detecting actual seizures. The most common thing is that over time, people just stop wearing it. And if you don't wear it, it's not useful. Um, one major limitation, although, again, I think it's not as important for uh, injury prevention, uh, but is that it really doesn't detect other kinds of seizures. It only tells you if you're having a convulsive seizure. And early on, uh, some people were complaining that connectivity was not great. Uh, and most of that is resolved by keeping the phone closer to you rather than far away so that the Bluetooth connection is good. So that's the Embrace 2. I actually, in anybody who is young, has nighttime seizures, uh, uh, especially that are convulsive, and if they don't have a bed partner who they can kick when they're having a seizure, um, I prescribe this to them because I do think that it uh, has a likely good benefit in reducing pseudopnosis. The second kind of watch is actually uh, an app that is connected to uh, a regular smartwatch. So either an Apple Watch or an Android-based uh, smartwatch. And it works basically the same way. Uh, but the main thing is that it has not gone through the rigorous, rigorous testing and approval process by the FDA. So I actually don't uh, recommend this. My patients come to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm using this and it seems to work. I don't have a problem with that. Something is better than nothing, uh, but because it's not FDA, I don't yet have uh, huge confidence that it works uh, that well. Nonetheless, uh, what it does is detect movements, abnormal movements, and it sends that detection to uh, a phone. That phone then kind of analyzes it and decides whether it's a seizure and then sends out a text alert to contact, and it records Sorry about that. It records uh, data about uh, the event uh, in the app, and then you can share that data with uh, physicians, caregivers, anybody who needs to know whether you're actually uh, seizing or not, or how often you're seizing. So because it's not FDA uh, cleared, the uh, company that makes it is very specific about saying this is not a medical device and not intended for diagnosis, monitoring, prevention, or treatment of disease. The reality is that patients do use it. I don't prescribe it, but I, I do think it's useful for people to know when they're evaluating what their options are. Uh, it does have some data behind it, and in uh, at least a couple of studies, uh, it does seem to pick up a lot of the convulsive seizures, so that it seems to pick up over 90% of the convulsive seizures. Uh, this doesn't tell how often you get false positives, but uh, it does pick up with convulsive seizures. The main mattress device uh, is this device called uh, MFIT, and 
it's a device, basically a flat movement detector that can be put under mattresses, and it's connected by a wire to this computer processor that detects the movements uh, and then can send out either an audible alarm or it can send out a, a message to somebody via wireless uh, communication. Um, it is not an FDA approved device. It is uh, uh, approved in other countries and it's marketed in the U.S. Under, uh, uh, through this website called epiusa.net. Uh, one study that came out of a pediatric neurology group at the University of Tennessee uh, showed that it detected about 85% of convulsive seizures that happen in sleep. It was sensitive even for uh, children who don't weigh very much. So they were saying and it was pretty good in anybody above three years old. I suspect that also has to do with the thickness of the mattress. So perhaps if there was a thin mattress uh, between it, the device, and then below the device, the rest of the mattress. It's more expensive than the watches, right around $600 for the monitoring system. And as I said, uh, it's approved in the Europe, uh, but not in the US. The final uh, at-home device is uh, an infrared camera system. Uh, this is the camera system here. You can see the camera right in the middle. And these are the infrared uh, light emitting diodes that basically are going to illuminate uh, the subject. It's infrared so you can see in the dark. And presumably then you're gonna record things that happen in sleep. So you can put the camera wherever you want. Uh, uh, typically, if you're gonna be recording people in sleep, it'll be monitoring their bed. Again, because it's not a uh, medical device, because it hasn't been FDA cleared, it just detects unusual movements, not seizures. The hope is that their uh, you know, detection algorithm really is tuned to seizures, but no one can say that with certainty. Uh, and then it connects to a phone uh, via uh, uh, Wi-Fi. And it's more expensive. It's about $1,000 for the entire. That's all I'm going to talk about uh, the take-home uh, devices. Uh, oh, it does. Somebody, somebody apparently has the, uh, um, uh, uh, the Embrace 2, and it does uh, tell time. And I did not realize that. That's good to know. Why should you consider an implanted stimulator for seizure control? Um, and the answer basically comes down to a, uh, one factor, that seizure medications uh, are really good, but ultimately they only control about 70% of seizures. So about 30% of patients with epilepsy continue to have seizures despite medications. And in that 30%, the ideal next step is to find a small region of the brain that causes seizures and you know we, we put a, a laser fiber in and we ablate just that tiny part of the brain or if necessary you can do surgery and take out a larger part but not everybody uh, should get laser surgery or resective surgery what if for example there are multiple uh, seizure onset zones you can't go in and you can't resect you know, too many areas without doing damage. What if the seizures start from an area that is important for speech or important for movement control? So in those situations where we, what we call eloquent cortex, we like to not do resective surgery. And so now we have an option and that option is to put some kind of stimulator to reduce the seizure frequency. The one difference between a resective or ablative surgery and a, a neuromodulatory device is that when we want to do a laser ablation or surgery, our goal really is cure. When we're putting a neuromodulating stimulator in, we don't expect cure. Only about 10 to 11% of people end up seizure-free after implantation of a stimulus stimulator device, but many people end up with substantial reductions in their seizure frequency and that actually is a huge benefit. So those are the cases where I think a stimulator is really useful. So I, I'll call these stimulators neuromodulators uh, because what they're really doing is over time, they're modulating the, the uh, seizure propensity or the, the, the risk that the brain will seize. And there are three basic kinds. One is a vagal nerve stimulator. The second is a responsive neural stimulator. And the third is a deep brain stimulator. All three of these devices are now FDA approved. 
and they're implanted by a neurosurgeon, but each one functions a little bit differently and has slightly different advantages and disadvantages. So the vagal nerve stimulator was the very first one to get approved by the FDA. And uh, it's a device that's implanted uh, under the skin in the chest, and it has a stimulating wire that then wraps around the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve leaves from the brain stem of the brain. It goes into the uh, chest and abdomen, and it regulates things like heart rate. Uh, it has an effect on breathing. It controls speech, and it even, you know, uh, so it sends information to and from these organs and goes to the brain stem. And for some reason, stimulating this vagus nerve every few minutes over time reduces the seizure frequency. And we're not exactly sure how it works, but we think that it's somehow giving enough activity to the brain that it doesn't have to seize. So the FDA has approved it for adjunctive therapy, meaning it's not the only therapy you use. It has to come along with other medications. Uh, adjunctive therapy to reduce the frequency of seizures in patients who are four years uh, and older. And it works reasonably well. Um, this is basically uh, what I talked about. It works by stimulating the vagus nerve every few minutes, and you can also stimulate it with a magnet. So if you put a magnet over it, it'll give you extra stimulations, and you can do that whenever uh, a seizure happens. The newest models can actually detect seizures, and the way they detect seizures is by monitoring the heart rate. And whenever there's a spike in the heart rate that's abnormally large, it says there's a seizure here and it gives an extra stimulation with the idea that that extra stimulation can act to shut down the, the seizure. It doesn't always work that way, but um, it does you know, often work that way. <coughs> so uh, the, the evidence that VNS works is pretty strong now. And the interesting thing is that even though the idea for all of these devices is that they'll stimulate and stop a seizure, that's not exactly what we found. The best way it seems to work is that just over time, and when I say time, I mean months and years, it reduces the number of seizures that happen. And so uh, over the course of 10 years, uh, patients with a VNS saw anywhere from a 70 to 80% reduction in the frequency of seizures that they had. And on some occasions, it could actually stop individual seizures, either, either with a magnet or uh, by detecting the seizures themselves. One recent uh, benefit that has come up is that the VNS also seems to improve depression. So as you probably know, Patients with epilepsy often have depression. At least 30% of patients with epilepsy also have depression. And I say that it's part of the same disease. And it turns out that often when you're treating one, you're either making, one, making the other better or worse, depending on how you're doing the treatment. Well, with VNS, it seems that over the same time course of months and years, you can not only reduce seizure frequency, but you can improve uh, symptoms of depression. And so, for me, when I have patients who have severe depression, especially, and epilepsy, this is a really good option uh, with the hope of improving both. It does have uh, side effects, and the biggest side effect uh, is because the vagus nerve, as I said, actually uh, controls the voice box. And so the anatomy of the vagus nerve is kind of interesting. It goes down and innervates the lungs and the stomach, but the part of it that innervates the voice box comes down into the neck under the aorta and then comes right back up to the larynx. And when it gets stimulated, uh, what can happen is that it will often cause a temporary constriction of the, the airway and that voice box. And so especially when the VNS is first turned on, people patients will have a big cough and it'll irritate them. And sometimes that cough can last for a while. So if, if the current stimulus goes up too high and they have consistent coughs, we'll often back it down so that it doesn't cause a cough. But even when it doesn't cause a cough, it can cause hoarseness. And what that means is that 
usually you, you wouldn't notice it, but if you have a family member with a VNS or you yourself have a VNS, um, you'll often notice that as they're speaking, their voice will get a little hoarse. Um, and that uh, goes along with the stimulation period of the VNS. Uh, a fun thing that I teach my uh, students in anatomy, uh, based on this anatomy, can you guess what the longest nerve is in, an, in a land-based animal? And I'll, I'll, uh, I promise a Krispy Kreme donut uh, to anyone who can tell me what animal and what nerve is both. It, it turns out that it's this vagus nerve in the giraffe because the nerve has to go all the way down the, the neck of the giraffe into the chest, wrap back around, and then come up to the larynx. So it's just a fun thing. So the other, um, the other question, uh, there were some good, very good questions. Can it uh, cause uh, skipped heartbeats? Um, it typ typically doesn't. I'm not gonna say that it never does. Um, you know, the heart itself actually has its own rhythm. And so it doesn't need the vagus nerve to uh, uh, stimulate to keep the heartbeat going, but it can uh, modulate the heart rhythm. And sometimes uh, that does sort of come up as a skipped beat. If you if you if you actually have noticed that or if you felt that, I think that's something worth telling uh, your doctor about. And that's actually something we can uh, look for uh, just by hooking up a, a heart rhythm monitor. Uh, and see if it does happen with uh, the rhythmicity of the VNS stimulations. Uh, it's not actually one of the most uh, uh, common side effects, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it does happen. The next device I'm going to talk about is called the Responsive Neural Stimulator. And uh, it has kind of similar words uh, in the FDA approval as the VNS. It's for adjunctive therapy. Again, it's not to be used alone. It's to be used in conjunction with medication to reduce the, the frequency of seizures. And it's currently approved in patients who are 18 years or older who have uh, partial or focal onset seizures uh, and uh, don't have more than two different sites at which the seizures are starting. Um, the, uh, so, it's kind of been, uh, for me, it's actually the device I like to use the best because it forces us to really find where those seizures are coming from. And if we can find that uh, exact onset zone, then we're able to uh, intervene very specifically in that, that one location. Um, one of the limitations has been that it's been restricted to people 18 years or older. But uh, at uh, Comer Children's Hospital at the University of Chicago, we are now part of uh, a clinical trial uh, that uh, will be uh, attempting to uh, place this in uh, and see whether it's effective in children under 18. So the basics of the responsive neural stimulator. Um, we go through a process of trying to figure out where the seizures are coming from. And then based on that process, we place stimulating electrodes exactly where we think the seizures are coming from. So in this case, there's a strip of electrodes that is over the lateral portion of the temporal lobe, and there's another uh, deep electrode that's going into the hippocampus where seizures often come from. And these electrodes are connected by wires to a small microprocessor and battery that is implanted into the skull. So there's a little bit of a craniotomy, and then they kind of put a plate in. And then they screw this battery and uh, computer into that plate. And that small computer is always monitoring brain activity in the places where we think the seizures are coming from. And it's waiting to see when the uh, brain activity changes from normal to abnormal. And there's an increase in uh, seizure uh, activity. When a seizure is detected, the computer then stimulates, sends out a stimulating current to interrupt that seizure. And we know from uh, both animal studies and uh, a, a wide range of human uh, ex examples in which you see a seizure and you give a current immediately that you can disrupt the seizure 
uh, with, when you detect it early enough. Uh, I'm going to show you a video that the company has produced. Just know that it's a company video, but uh, I, I do think that it's fun to see, and it's kind of it is illustrative of how the device works. Oops, I did not mean to stop sharing that. So let me see if I can share this video here. Uh, so this is basically the same picture where you see the stimulating electrodes, and what's happening here is it's always detecting the brain activity, and it sends it up to the device. The device is then making a decision whether or not that's normal activity or seizure activity, and then once it decides that it's seizure activity, it's going to send out uh, a stimulus to the uh, so at least that's how it was supposed to work. It was supposed to work, detect, and then shut down every seizure that it sees. In fact, um, it seems to work in the same way the VNS does, meaning that over years, it reduces the seizure frequency. It also sort of directly stops the seizures where they start, but over years, even if it's not stopping every seizure, it reduces the seizure frequency so that the number of seizures that it detects goes down. And so over uh, you know, six years, there is a 60 to 70% reduction. And now they've even got data past the six year mark where it shows that there's an even slightly more improved seizure control. So in none of these devices do you get complete seizure freedom. Only about 13% uh, of patients are seizure free for over a year, but the seizure frequency goes down a lot. Um, you know, with all of these devices, there are side effects and infections are a, a major uh, issue with all of the devices. So uh, there is about a three and a half percent infection risk. Those infections have been soft tissue, meaning muscle or skin, uh, and extremely rare uh, that you end up with a, a long-term neurological deficit uh, as a result of any of these. Uh, there's also a small risk of bleeding associated with it because you are putting electrodes into the brain, you are doing a craniotomy. So those are small risks, but I, I think you know those are worth discussing. And if the you know the potential benefit doesn't outweigh those risks, then you know I would say don't do the procedure. But oftentimes, you know we're we're really looking for something that can help and reduce the seizure risk. Okay, the final. Um, area, uh, the final type of stimulator is the deep brain stimulator. And this, the deep brain stimulator has been around for uh, uh, a long time for Parkinson's disease. And I think there's a question in the, the chat, uh, is the deep brain stimulator version relative uh, uh, to similarities with the deep brain stimulator for Parkinson's disease? And in fact, it's exactly the same device. It's just put in a slightly different location. So the deep brain stimulator was uh, started for Parkinson's, and in Parkinson's, it goes to the parts of the brain that control tremors. And so it will stimulate on a regular basis, basically disrupting the brain activity that causes tremors. And so it makes the tremors go away, and uh, it helps smooth movement. Um, they then took the same device and shifted it to a different part of the brain, uh, a, a nucleus in the brain called the anterior nucleus. Um, so somebody's asking about the hippocampus, so that the anterior nucleus of the thalamus is actually connected to the hippocampus, and it's part of that same network. So we'll, we, I'll answer this question in a little more detail with respect to both the RNS and the DBS, but uh, it's important to realize that the, the hippocampus has is at risk for seizures uh, and it's connected to the anterior uh, thalamic nucleus. And the DBS idea is to disrupt the seizures when they get to the anterior uh, thalamic nucleus. And th there was a Sante trial done from 2009 to 2014 that showed that, in fact, it does work and it's effective in doing that. And it, uh, it was approved uh, in 2017 for the treatment of seizures. So uh, the the DBS electrodes are typically placed bilaterally, that means on both sides, into the anterior uh, thalamic nucleus. 
and it runs uh, on its own. So it really doesn't monitor too much. Most recently, they've, they've developed a way to monitor activity, but in fact, it doesn't do that good of a job of monitoring seizure activity. The, the, the monitoring system was really developed for Parkinson's disease, so it does a good job of marketing uh, of, of uh, monitoring Parkinson's kind of activity, uh, and they've sort of marketed it as also good for monitoring seizure activity, but in fact, that's kind of a mediocre job at that. Nonetheless, we can get information about uh, what the brain activity is like. So this is uh, a sort of a demonstration of each of the, the, the subjects that was in that initial Sante trial after five years. And it shows how much did seizures go down for each subject. So if seizures went down 100%, that means they were seizure free uh, for at least three months after five years. And you can see a lot of people were actually seizure free, but even if you weren't seizure free, the, the median sort of uh, halfway between uh, worst and best showed a 69 or 70% seizure reduction after uh, five years. There was a small number of subjects for whom it actually ended up, uh, you know, ended up having more seizures. Um, and I think, uh, you know, our hope is that it's not because of the device. You could just turn the device off if that was the case. But uh, it just happens that, that uh, you know, you're going to catch some people who are better or worse, and maybe they were just in that worst component. But it's not perfect for everybody. So on average, it does a pretty good job, but it doesn't work for everybody. Um, there are some adverse uh, events with uh, DBS. Um, uh, infection uh, uh, rate at uh, over five years is about 10%. Now, um, this is probably higher than uh, uh, it will be. This is out of the trial, but probably higher than it will be. But most of those infections are actually not brain related. They're actually at the incision site where you're putting the DBS device in the chest wall. Nonetheless, it's actually a higher infection rate than what you get with the RNS. Um, the, it's actually hard to target the electrodes to the exact thalamic nucleus because it's small. And so in the initial trial, about 8% actually missed that uh, thalamic target. Um, and there are sort of a variety of uh, other events that have been re reported, uh, uh, all of them less than 2%. Um, and then there were a lot of other uh, events that were reported, including sometimes worsening depression, uh, memory impairment. Uh, a few patients actually ended up with more seizures, as we saw on that previous slide. Um, it's hard to know often whether these side effects are related to the device itself or uh, uh, alternatively for, uh, you know, because there was a pre existing condition and it wasn't helped by that, either it progressed or it. It was present anyway. So those are, I, I think, in the last 10 years, we've got a lot of nice new options that we can tailor and say, okay, is the DBS right for you? Is the uh, responsive neural stimulator right for you? Can we get away with a vagal nerve stimulator? Or, uh, uh, you know, should we do laser ablation? Now, laser ablation isn't something I talked about, but it's a, for, for my money, that's actually kind of the biggest and best advance we've had in the last 10 or 15 years, because you can really go in with minimal uh, discomfort and without taking a large skull part off and without doing a large brain resection and really address many, many seizures. Okay, that's all I had to say. There are some uh, really nice sites, uh, epilepsy.com. Uh, Danny did uh, organization has a really nice uh, site. And then if you're interested in the brain stimulation, uh, I was surprised at, at how nice and, and useful this uh, NIH site was, just giving a history of how brain stimulation came up. Okay, so there are some really good questions in the chat. So let me take the most recent one. Um, uh, any studies correlating diets and seizures? And uh, the answer with that is definitely. Um, so we've known for a long time the ketogenic diet 
is really good for uh, epilepsy. And, you know, that comes from really the very first effective treatment for epilepsy in, in biblical times when seizures were thought that the body was being seized by a, a demon. And so they would, you know, cast the people out into the desert for 40 days. Well, what that meant was that they couldn't eat. And so their metabolism shifted. So they were starting to break down proteins in their body. And they shifted from a sugar-based uh, uh, energy supply in their body to a protein-based, or what we call ketone-based. And so it's really cutting out the, uh, the sugars that then put the people into seizure freedom. They would come back into the village, say, I no longer have seizures. They'd have a big party, grapes and bread, and they would start seizing again. So, um, but, but this sort of led to the idea of a ketogenic diet, and, and we do believe a ketogenic diet. We have a ketogenic diet clinic here. Uh, the problem with the ketogenic diet is that it's really hard to keep um, uh, strict with. And if you break ketosis, meaning if you have a piece of bread, you have to start all over with the ketogenic diet. So there are some less restrictive diets, uh, like a modified Atkins diet, that are easier to uh, stick with and do think that we, we do think that there is some uh, benefit reducing uh, uh, seizure frequency with that. Uh, I myself don't manage ketogenic diet. I send them to our ketogenic diet clinic. Dr. Fitzanawong there does a great job uh, and can give a variety of options. I hope that helps both the protein therapy and the, uh, the diet question. Protein therapy, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what protein therapy is other than sort of the diet-based modified Atkins or ketogenic diet. And so I would, I would sort of push you in that direction. Um, okay, are stimulators safe for use uh, during pregnancy? And that's a really good question. Um, I don't know of any studies that say they're not. Uh, and I, to be honest, I'm going to have to review exactly that question before I give you uh, a question. I have not actually had to uh, uh, deal with that question in my practice at this point. I can tell you that we can turn the stimulators off, right? So there's nothing. The VNS we def, we, we use, patients with the VNS uh, and are pregnant, we, we definitely use. The, the DBS and uh, the RNS. I haven't used in patients with uh, who are pregnant, but we can turn them off. In that situation, I think the bigger question is, do we want to put one in while somebody's pregnant? And I would say no, because you don't want to run the risk of infection and so on. But if people get pregnant with that, I think those are we, we can manage that. Um, let me just see if there's another question before I get to the epidiolex. Okay, so seeing as the hippocampus is kind of a watershed area susceptible to uh, infarctions, how do we monitor, uh, what precautions do we take to prevent that? So the hippocampus, um, actually within terms of, in terms of uh, ischemic or, or strokes, is relatively infrequent compared to other areas. You can get strokes with it, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a branch of an often artery that, uh, we don't usually get with uh, sort of the, the most common strokes, but we can get strokes in the hippocampus. Um, it's relatively rare to have an event related to implantation give you uh, a, a blood clotting stroke that affects the, the hippocampus. More commonly and more concerning is when you're putting electrodes in whether you're going to nick a blood vessel and cause a bleeding stroke. That actually, fortunately, in, in our center has been extremely rare. Uh, on the couple of occasions where we have had bleeding strokes, uh, they're asymptomatic, meaning they're usually uh, just along the, the path of the electrode, and uh, they don't um, end up uh, causing a major clinical issue. They can, uh, but it's extremely rare. And Dr. Warnicke, I can't, um, I can't talk highly enough 
about Dr. Warnicke's skills as a neurosurgeon. Uh, and so I just, I trust him a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, next question I think was uh, Epidiolex. So Epidiolex is um, cannabidiol or, uh, oil. And as you know, marijuana has two uh, uh, chemicals in it that are uh, that affect seizures. One is tetrahydrocannabinoid or THC, and that's the hallucinogen in uh, marijuana. That we think of as actually pro-convulsant. It actually makes you seize more. Cannabidiol, on the other hand, if anything, is anti-convulsant. So uh, cannabidiol is what's used in epidiolex, and that's been proven to help in patients with a certain kind of uh, epilepsy, either Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which are pediatric into adult uh, kinds of epilepsy. Does it work as well in adults with focal onset epilepsy? And that's a mixed bag. For some people, it works well, and often we'll end up having patients who are, uh, are self-medicating with uh, um, with marijuana or cannabidiol oil, and it works well for them. In a few cases that I started prescribing Epidiolex in adults with focal onset epilepsy, it actually didn't help, and in a couple of cases it hurt, so I backed off of that. So I'm not a huge advocate for cannabidiol in adults with focal onset epilepsy, but there are recent studies that are saying that that it does potentially help. So I'm gonna to wait to see how that plays out. If people come to me and say, you know, I've actually been using cannabidiol and it works, I say, great, don't stop, you know. But uh, if they say I'm using marijuana, uh, I say, you gotta be very careful if you're using marijuana and you're not going to cannabidiol. And in that case, I'll sort of push them towards medical marijuana, cannabidiol oils, uh, rather than uh, just straight up. Um, uh, uh, mixed THC. Um, so some great uh, uh, thank you for uh, your endorsements of Dr. Fatanawang. I think he's a phenomenal physician and he really does take care of uh, ketogenic diet really well. Okay, do stimulators affect patients' ability to have MRIs or CT scans? Great, great question. Um, CT scans, you will get some medical artifacts, uh, some metal artifacts but we can typically see through them. Until recently, uh, it was uh, not possible to get MRIs with uh, an RNS, but now the new RNS devices are uh, MRI, not compatible, uh, conditional, I think is the term, MRI conditional. So you can get MRIs with 1.5T uh, uh, power. So the lower power MRIs you can use. With the vagal nerve stimulator, you can get an MRI with a vagal nerve stimulator, but you need to turn off the vagal nerve stimulator so that it's not constantly triggering and giving excess uh, stimulations. And that allows you then, when you turn it on, you can turn it back on to make sure that for some odd reason the magnet hasn't changed any of the settings. Um, all right, uh, can... Uh, Icy carbamazepine, does that mean cold carbamazepine or just carbamazepine cause seizures? Um, carbamazepine, so all of the anti-seizure medications, uh, actually, if you get to too high of a level uh, when, when they're really toxic, they can actually cause seizures. Typically, in the therapeutic range, if they're correctly uh, prescribed, they don't cause seizures. Carbamazepine is a group of, of anti-seizure anti medications in a class called sodium channel blockers. And if those are used in uh, a different, in the wrong class of seizures, they can actually worsen seizures. But in adults who have new onset, focal onset seizures, carbamazepine should not be a problem. It should not cause seizures typically. Okay, so uh, there's another question. Um, is it necessary uh, to stay on meds uh, or 
or uh, if you've been seizure free for a long time, can you eventually come off? Uh, I do actually uh, give trials on patients who've been seizure free for a long time and their EEG doesn't show any seizure activity. Uh, I, I am often open to a trial of coming off the anti seizure medications. I do it slowly. If you've been on seizure medications for a long time and you just stop it, almost certainly you're going to seize. And the reason for that is the brain reorganizes in response to seizure medication. And if you just stop right away, it's oversensitized and it's going to seize. So I'm willing to you know, give people a trial if under the right conditions, but then come off. There's some times where we're pretty sure that coming off of seizure medications isn't going to be successful. And in those situations, I kind of just try to dissuade people. But if you've got a normal MRI, EEG has been clean, you've been uh, uh, seizure-free for five or 10 years, and uh, you're willing to not drive during that weaning period, I'm willing to give it a try. Um, okay, so there's a question of how can the stimulators tell between a heart rate increase um, that's uh, caused by a seizure and a heart rate increase that's physiological, meaning when it's supposed to happen, or when it's, you know, when you get scared, something like that. And in fact, there are lots of false positives. So it detects things incorrectly and it gives you an extra stimulation. For the VNS, it doesn't much matter. Um, you're getting those extra stimulation, you're getting stimulations every five minutes or every three minutes anyway. So uh, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but uh, um, it does get it wrong sometimes. But the goal is you don't care with, with these detectors, you don't care so much if it's getting it wrong as long as it's getting it right most of the time. And that's when it's really more important. Okay. Um, if a child is 11 and on trileptal, Depakote and Epidiolex, now has epileptic spasms, can this be from any of the medications? Okay, was diagnosed with double cortex and focal seizures, but they, now they are spasms. Okay, this is, this is a very complicated situation and a complicated question. and, and uh, I'm actually going to not answer it, and I'm not going to answer it because uh, that child deserves to be taken care of by a pediatric epileptologist, not by an adult epileptologist. And and we adult epileptologists are really good, but for kids, the pediatric epileptologists are the right people to to be speculating on this, not not me. So I don't, I don't want to um, sort of tread where I shouldn't be talking. Other questions? This has been a lot of fun. Uh, this has it's been really nice to great. have so many people on. Yeah, I feel like you've worn multiple hats during this entire <laughs> hour. You've answered all <laughs> kinds of incredible questions. I knew people would really enjoy learning from you. And I just want, I just have one question just to kind of circle back to the very beginning. You were talking about devices. I think one of the biggest takeaways from all of this is that, you know, you stress the importance of, of getting device and so that family can know what's happening with their loved ones. So, you know, you've posted some great websites here. Is there anything else or any other barriers that um, I think cost is probably the biggest barrier, but anything else that we can work on um, to help kind of reduce and mitigate some of these barriers for families? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I, and I know uh, you know the Epilepsy Foundation, you know, and other organizations like Danny did actually have situation have uh, some pockets of money. I don't know where the pockets of money or who has it, to help people when it's really uh, financial, and I think that's a good option. Uh, I think you know the, the work that Epilepsy Foundation. So one of the things I I do on the side with the Epilepsy Foundation is review. Uh, new proposals for projects, especially epilepsy therapy projects. And from a foundation and an NGO standpoint, a non-governmental organization standpoint, this is one of the best things that these organizations do is they find these technologies that uh, are early, they fund them, they get them to um, a point where they've got enough preliminary data that they can get big money to uh, uh, really fund the, those clinical trials to get up to FDA. So 
I guess one of the things that I would say is that what you're doing in funding these projects and bringing in support from the community to do that is a major, major benefit to this community. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's, if you have, if maybe you have ideas, maybe you've heard things from other people, maybe everybody else, what, what do you guys feel like would be the best way of getting these things to you? So I see a lot of patients, but I don't live with epilepsy at home. And so while I, I'm happy to give advice, you guys are the ones who actually have the most experience and know what you need. So tell us. Yeah, I mean, I, like the way, go ahead, sorry. That's right. I have a question, but I don't know how to get the chat to work. So, oh. um, and I don't want to interrupt that. I just want to make sure I get a chance to ask it. Yep. So um, anyway, um, so Ralph is in the process of getting an RNS put in. Um, but he's on blood thinners, and I want to know what the, um, we're having some issues right now, like what do you think about people having, on blood thinners, having the surgery to put the yeah. RNS in? He's already that, had that, the, the, the testing, and is right, he's scheduled to have the surgery, but I just, we're having some trouble with wound healing, et cetera, and I wonder if the blood thinners, how, how it affects all that? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good question and an important question. Um, so I, I think that's going to be uh, something that's unique to every individual, and I'm not going to give a prescriptive, this is what has to happen every single time. But, but you know, there are increased risks because, you know, the electrodes are going to have to be placed, so that does increase the risk of bleeding. Um, now, presumably that the blood thinner is gonna be stopped for the implantation and the healing time, but you also have to balance with what is the reason for the blood thinner and is it okay to wait those two or three or six weeks or whatever it's gonna to need to heal. So the, that, that balance really um, has to be made on an individual by individual basis. So for example, with atrial fibrillation, if the indication for blood thinner is atrial fibrillation, it's often okay to you know, wait you know, uh, weeks. Uh, if the indication is recurrent deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary emboli, that's a different issue. If there's a, you know, so those, those issues are kind of difficult to deal with and you need to come up with a plan with a neurosurgeon, neurologist, and uh, probably a hematologist to come up with the ideal approach. But yes, there's a risk. Okay, because that's what that's a, that's where we are right now is to, um, we're, we've gone this far, but um, he's having some issues. And so we're I'm at the part where we're kind of talking, talking through it and trying to figure out what the best way to do it is. So thank you. Yeah, I, I guess what I would say is that all of the centers in Chicago that do RNS, I have faith that, that not just the University of Chicago, but any of them, you know, approach this in a, in a thoughtful way. Okay, we, his doctor is in um, mm -hmm. Grand Rapids in Michigan. Oh. And we, uh, okay. we found so out Rapids, about him. Back from Dr. Burdett and his team are, yes. are excellent. Yes. yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I would not, I, you know, yeah, I wouldn't second guess them from my position. They're really quite a good team as well. Okay. Okay. We found out about them through one of these webinars. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, there's a question in the chat um, that I was thinking, just looking for more resources. And I think this is the part where I plug the Epilepsy Foundation of Greater Chicago. Definitely, we can be a conduit to connecting people to resources. Um, all of our programs and services are free. It takes just a few moments to do the intake over the phone, and then you'll have access to everything, um, you know, from support groups to emergency services, um, all this information. I mean, we really pride ourselves on being the conduit of information and just a library of resources. So that's definitely one thing I would like to plug right here. Yeah. And actually, one of the things that, that uh, Aisha and team did uh, this year was sort of 
reach out to all of our epilepsy, found, uh, epilepsy centers in Chicago and sort of give us inf not only information, but introduction to really what services we can uh, provide, what they can provide to you. And I now sort of put that with every you know, discharge summary or after visit summary for my patients, because if you are not connected to them, they can fill in a lot of gaps that, you know, individual centers don't have, you know, a lot of. So Comer doesn't, for example, have case managers that uh, would go with every uh, uh, case, but but you can often get that same kind of support through Epilepsy Foundation Greater Chicago.